So um, uh, throughout my scientific career, I have been interested uh, in, in working with um, uh, pattern recognition tools. And pattern recognition is the old fashioned name for what we now call machine learning. And indeed this project is about discovering extraterrestrial intelligence with artificial intelligence. Now, um, one of the, oh, something is going wrong with the control. So one of the uh, uh, interesting things about our universe is that we have over, in the visible universe, we have over 125 billion galaxies. Like uh, the Milky Way is our own galaxy, but we have 125 billion of them. And that's only in the visible universe. And of course, the rest we cannot see. Then in each galaxy, there are about 100 to 400,000 million stars. And that's also true for the Milky Way. And each of these stars hosts at least one planet, and a considerable fraction of these planets is in the so-called habitable zone, which means that it's not too cold or too hot uh, for uh, life as we know it to emerge, let alone life that we don't know, but life that we don't know, we don't know anything about. Okay, so um, one of the things, so next slide please. Uh, one of the things that we can see in recent years is an enormous uh, upsurge in the collection of data about so-called exoplanets. These are planets that are moving around stars other than the sun. And all these stars are far away, so it's hard to see them through a telescope. But as you can see from this picture, this is showing the number of detected exoplanets uh, over every, the, the past years. You see these green bars. The green parts of these bars reflect the recognition or detection of these exoplanets by means of the so-called transit method. And I will explain you what this method is. Next slide, please. Uh, and with this method, uh, uh, the, the data for these methods is collected by so-called um, uh, satellites. And one of them is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite test. Please click it. Yes, this is an animation showing tests. And it's uh, currently in the sky out there collecting data for us. It just had two years of data collection of a lot of bright brightness variations in stars. And uh, you should imagine that it hosts several cameras that are looking at, sky, at the sky and each pixel is illuminated by one or more stars and it's tracking the brightness variations over time. So next slide, please. So this is a, a kind of animation that shows the transit method. So you have an artist impression of a star and you see a planet moving in front of it and a nice dip in brightness. And the idea is if you use this uh, camera of tests or other surveys, you can detect the passing of an exoplanet or something else uh, in front of the star uh, between actually the star and the camera of this satellite. Next slide, please. So what you see here is what a, a light curve, uh, this is this brightness dip, is looking uh, uh, like in reality. It's quite noisy. And this light curve shows the intensity or brightness variations over time. Uh, astronomers refer to this as the flux. That you, that's what you see on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis is time. Now, the point is, it's very hard to recognize patterns here. And you have two options to find these patterns. One is to use humans. And actually, with uh, a previous survey, the so-called Kepler survey, there was a Planet Hunters project, a citizen science project, where people all across the world could analyze uh, these kind of uh, curves by using a simple web interface. And, uh, but as you can see, it's hard to see anything here. But the next slide shows you what a more uh, a better light curve looks like. And this is one that is detrended and some other signal processing tricks have been applied. And what you see is a regular pattern of dips. And these dips correspond to a planet moving in front of a star. Now to enhance the signal to noise ratio and the visibility, you can superimpose these dips and then you get the graph shown on the bottom. And this pattern that you see here reveals something about the shape and the size of the, the object moving in front of the star. And this shows that this is a planet, but it could also be another star. If you have an eclipsing binary, as it's called, that's it, 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 it just two stars that move in front of each other, it might look very similar. So it's a subtle pattern recognition task. Next slide, please. Now, the predecessor of this was Kepler. And in AI research, uh, this Kepler data is used for the simple reason that it's not only providing light curves, but also so-called labels, so that you know for each light curve whether it's corresponding to a, an exoplanet or not. 
Next slide, please. So Kepler was looking at a fixed position, a fixed region in the sky. And this animation, if you click, you see the animation, uh, is the collection of all the data uh, of Kepler over different quarters. And what you see, it's comparing the, uh, the length of a year, that's the horizontal axis. The Earth is, of course, around 365 days. But you see a lot of uh, exoplanets that have a shorter year. And on the vertical axis, you see the size. So many of the planets were larger. Probably this is an artifact of the, the, the way that the data is collected. Next slide, please. So all this data, this data release, was used in 2018 by an engineer from Google and an astronomer who used a deep convolutional neural network, which is at the heart of the current AI revolution and is used for image recognition and many other tasks. But they used it to uh, train the system on recognizing light curves. And uh, they used in this network, which is quite custom, uh, an enormous amount of number of free parameters. These are values that have to be set by a learning algorithm. 29.8 million parameters. And they achieved an accuracy on this data set by Kepler of 96% correct. And they achieved that uh, amongst others by using uh, the, the engines of, at, at Google, of course, to automatically set the structure of the network, so-called hyperparameter optimization. Now, together with my colleagues, Coco Visser and Bas, uh, Bosma, next slide, please. We try to simplify this network by reducing the number of parameters. And the simplified architecture, and this is ongoing work, now has a 70-fold reduction with respect to Astronet in the number of parameters. It's, as you can see, it's much simpler. And it uh, suffers in terms of performance only 0.7%. And of course, we try to improve that, but uh, the hyperparameter optimization was not uh, done with uh, Google, but was done by Coco Visser. And he's a great researcher, but he can, of course, not compete with all these servers by Google. Next slide, please. So another line of research is anomaly detection. And for anomaly detection, we use all kinds of techniques that take a part of the light curve and try to predict the next samples of the light curve. The, the traditional techniques to do that, for instance, in economics, are ARIMA and related models, linear models. But we also experimented with transformer networks, which is a, a kind of novel deep learning approach. And we were able to predict the future uh, occurrences of the light curve and also to, to detect the deviations from that anomalies with a 40% improvement in root mean squared error. And we applied it to the Kepler data and we found uh, of the, all, all the data, we found about 40 anomalies. 39 of them were related to machine failures of the satellite itself or rotation uh, movements or some sunlight what was, that was reflected in the camera. And one was a rediscovery of Tabby star. And Tabby star is uh, named after an astronomer that studied a particular star. But actually, the light curve, the anomaly of the light curve, was detected by planet hunters, the citizen scientists. So next slide, please. They discovered this light curve. And as you can see, you see these dips, but they're not regular. And actually, the depth of the dips is much larger than you would expect for a transiting planet. So uh, there was all kinds of speculation that this might maybe relate to an idea of um, Fr Freeman Dyson who once proposed that alien civilizations would try to build a, a sphere surrounding a star to collect energy. So maybe we had detected an alien civilization. And uh, as you can see, this is something that does not look like the regular pattern that I showed before. Next slide, please. But after some follow-up studies, uh, it turned out that astron astronomers discovered that the most likely explanation for this strange light curve is uh, a couple of asteroids or a damaged planet that uh, is associated with a lot of dust. So uh, unfortunately, no alien civilizations detected yet. Next slide, please. So what this shows is that with these deep learning methods, you can contribute uh, to science by helping to sift to the ever-growing scientific data volume in astronomy, cosmology, and in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. For instance, there's now this Breakthrough Listen project, which is generating lots of data. And there are also other astronomy projects that are uh, creating an exponential increase in the amount of data. It's undoable for humans to, to sift through all this data. So this means that AI is changing the way that science is being performed, not only in these fields, but also in other fields, 
if you think about the recent breakthrough of AlphaFold, the big mind uh, a breakthrough for protein, fill, protein folding. That's one of the many examples that you can read about in the papers every week. And I think for all branches of science, it's essential that you understand the you strength have five minutes left, Eric. of AI and that it's essential to all scientific disciplines. Last slide, please. So that brings us to the question, is there intelligence out there? And that's, of course, a question that we cannot answer yet. And you might be familiar with the Fermi's paradox. So if the universe is teeming with uh, uh, exoplanets, and by the way, by the time of Enrico Fermi, it was not known that there were so many exoplanets, but he knew about the uh, enormous amount of stars that are out there. So why haven't we seen them yet? Now, there are many possible explanations. One popular explanation, which is a bit aligned with our zeitgeist, is that there might be these filters. And of course, we know about these filters, so meteor meteorites that can... Uh, damage a complete civil or eradicate a complete civilization, whether it's dinosaurs or more advanced civilizations. Pandemics, we're witnessing one now, or nuclear war or anything else could wipe out a civilization. And it would be very sad that there might be other civilizations out there, but we can't see them because they already are gone. They are already gone. And I would like to end with a, a nice quote by Max Tegmark. He is uh, a researcher in physics, but also in AI. Uh, and he said, we should be open to the possibility that the destiny of life in the cosmos is upon us. In other words, that we are alone. And in that case, we should be better stewards of the earth we have. Thank you very much.